Hi, my name's Dale, and welcome back to Metal Tips and Tricks. Today, we're in Royce Chambers. Chambers Shop, and we're actually here in Sterling, Colorado. He, uh, he took me up on my invitation as I'm driving around the country to come by and see his shop. Now, there's going to be another video that I have already shot. We went out to an old sugar mill that had the machine shop almost completely there and had several large lathes and some other stuff, which I think you guys are going to love. But right now, we're going to reduce down to the size of lathes. I have never seen a Duro lathe before. Tell me about it, Royce. Well, they were made in California, I think starting during the war, because there's some speculation that they used them for building instruments. But they started out as kind of a watchmaker's lathe. They made several different models, and the company changed hands, and then they kind of disappeared about in the early 50s, I guess. And so the motor fits that? all in it, yeah. all the gearing, and you told me that... Was change gears available for the lead. And it's fantastic because there's actually a small rack here, so we have a half nut. There's a, a cross feed, and it also has a compound. No, they didn't come with a compound, with just the two. Feed. Now, was the cross feed ever powered? No. I know, I'm asking a lot, but it's like, there, it's just such a great machine. And I've never seen one before, so now I'm going to have to start hunting for one. I just want you guys to know there's a few parts missing on this. What, what parts are missing? It's missing the cross slide and the tool post, the lantern type tool post. They had a lantern okay. type tool post holder. Okay. This duo lathe, that some of the earlier lathes were a little smaller. They were two and a half inch, I think, and this is a three inch. Okay. So the tool post for this one has an extra riser in it. I'm missing the rack that the carriage moves the carriage back and forth and okay. it's just a brass rack which I think I can make without any problems uh -huh. and I'm missing the other big piece is the cover that goes on this end. You're telling me somebody who's still manufacturing those? Yeah I've seen on <laughs> eBay a guy that was reproducing them okay. and they were kind of pricey and it wasn't for the duo lathe it was for the mono lathe uh -huh. and the mono lathe has a lot thinner cover. From what I've been able to find out these black colored duo lathes are very rare Okay. And the serial number normally is on the rack on a on a Manson lathe, which was the original. Okay. On the rack right here, this one has a serial number stamped in here, and it's 31. A fairly early one, and they probably didn't make Tony's lathes or whatever the UK website that is extremely good and has a lot of information. But the highest number he'd seen was like 47. Oh, it really is rare then. So they're pretty rare, and and. But that wasn't a black one, it was a polished aluminum. There's quite a story to them. And the bed on here is also cast steel. Yes. And you have the correct foot switch, but it's not quite the correct motor. I've got one that came with the lathe, but doesn't fit in the lathe correctly. So there you go, guys. We're looking for, for some parts now. Well, and I'd just like to correspond with anybody else that has one. And what you can do is just leave in the comments, and he can reply to you in the comments, and we'll just go from there. Now we're going to talk about small engines. One of Royce's other joys are small steam engines. So here's a couple steam engines you've built. So tell me about these. This is the first engine I built and it was from plans in Home Shop Machinist very early on in the early 90s I guess. Uh, it's from plans in Home Shop Machinist like I said uh, Rudy Cowhut. He did many many articles for Home Shop Machinist and projects in metal. Pretty much bar stock engines, no castings involved. And something that a lot of them were beginners type engines, which this was. This engine probably, it's what got me started really. Gave me the confidence to keep going. With. From here, you kind of took the same design, but then made it your own. Yeah, I wanted, of course that's a horizontal engine. I decided I want a vertical engine. So I used basically a lot of the same components. The cylinder is pretty much the same, except this bolts to this angle iron. This has a head on it, so it's got three bolt holes. The, of course, the column's different, but the, the bearings are the same, the piston's the same, the valve, crank disc, connecting rods. This one has a solid disc flywheel that when I learn how to do bolt hole circles, bolt hole circles after I've watched Dale's video, I got an idea on that now. <laughs> it's a simple way of doing it. This flywheel was built up from a piece of water pipe. Oh, really? And I turned the center separate, and if you look, you can see. Oh, so you the drilled it through? drilled all the way through. They were all sticking out, and I got it centered as good as I could and soldered it together. That's a fantastic solution. You guys also know how much I love to do solder. That engine's run quite a bit, and actually I trued it up after I soldered it. But now you've got a new, it's not a steam engine, it is a... This is a vacuum engine. 
from the Vacuum Rotor Company. I believe they were built in the 30s, maybe the 20s. I saw this on eBay and had to have it. We, got, we, all, we all know it. that feeling, don't we, guys? Learned a little more about it. Um, Mr. Pete had one even after I got to looking on his videos. He didn't have real good luck with it. This one, of course, isn't in running condition. But if you search for them on YouTube, you will find several videos of them running. The crank disc is off right now. The piston on this one is pretty sad shape. And these things don't have enough power to overcome very many obstacles. So things have to be about right. This one's worn on the bore. I'm probably gonna have to bore it out because uh, it's got, I think about 3000 taper. It needs to fit pretty close. So. Yes, you can't lose that energy, can you? And I love the cam right here. Yeah. And you can see how it activates. And it's all cat. It's a casting that they didn't even, doesn't even look like they remachined it. Well, some, I mean, but not much. And then right here we would have the wick. And we can actually put the fuel inside here. That's a fuel tank. Okay. There's a valve, like a D valve on a steam engine that goes in this slot. When the valve's open, it sucks the flame in. And the, when it closes, the, the heated air cools down, creates a vacuum in the cylinder, and pulls the piston up to the top. And then, of course, the valve opens and it goes back through the same. And there were a lot of model hot air engines, and you see a lot of guys making them now, but I don't know of anybody using it in a practical application. I'd like to, if somebody knows one, I'd like to hear about it. Leave it in the comments. Royce has some other things. We're not gonna go through everything. Well, we have mystery tools we can go through. He's showing me some of those. And I don't know, we may touch on the mystery tools, um, but let's talk about some of the uh, small vices that you got. Royce, let's talk about your vice collection here. Now, you've kind of just happened into it, but this is your very first one. Tell me about that. First of all, I want to say, I don't think I have any vices I want to give up. Okay, so we're not <laughs> selling anything. You guys remember that. This vice is one I had from the time I was probably 10 years old. I had a little workshop in the basement of my parents' house and been through a lot with this vice and it's served me well. Now, is that the original color? No, I painted it a okay. long time ago. Been that way for many years. So that's my first vice. And recently, I learned about baby bullets. And then I learned about Tom Lipton <laughs> and the baby bullet that he made. But these vices are just... Now, this one, I'm not sure. This one actually looks a little smaller than Tom's. See the same size. It's the same size. Okay. They were all two-inch jaws. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. I have seen variations on these nuts. And this one was actually made in Schiller Park, which the original uh, Wilton vices were made in Chicago. And they'll say it right on the side. This has Schiller Park, um, but they're just a great little vice, high, very high quality in my, I just love small stuff, so. <laughs> now, let's go to this one. Where'd you find that at? I found this on the Junk Jaunt in Nebraska. Okay, tell us about the Junk Jaunt. The Junk Jaunt is basically a large garage sale that happens in September every year. Covers like 40 towns and a couple hundred miles. Everybody gets together and does it on the same weekend. They've had generally around 500 registered vendors. They put out a booklet <laughs> and uh, there's usually probably 500 that aren't registered that just know that there's going to be a billion people there looking for junk. Fantastic. Now in the registry, do they say kind of what they have also? Yeah, some of them list stuff, but unless you're there first thing in the morning, that's usually all gone. Okay. <laughs> but you still disappears. found this. But I found this vice. They evidently you stole it. Yeah, basically. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they had some watchmaker stuff at one of the sites that somebody died and they cleaned out his garage and this is a bowley which is a genuine watchmaker's vice i think they were made in can't remember now england or germany okay but it also is very high quality vice and what is great mm. here is the dovetail construction because what makes us unique also is the back jaw is what moves not the front jaw so that just makes it a little more unique than what we're normally used to what an excellent purchase. And he did say I stole it, but and you can use your own opinions, but I did pay $4. <laughs> okay, raise your hand if you think he stole it. <laughs> Thanks, guys. And then and this one here. Of course, now I've gotten several other small vices. This is one of my favorites that I got on eBay, and it's just, you know, it's a pretty good quality little vice, and, uh, which is what I like, one-inch jaws. And they're pretty common on eBay. And they... But it's just really a nice little vice. I like that it's spring-loaded. Yeah, That's just excellent. What a, what a fun collection. 
but I know what you guys really want to see now. I want to show you guys some mystery tools. He's got one that had me definitely, well, he had several, you definitely stumped me, but there's a good one in there that I think you guys want to see and probably really don't want to hear what it does because when you do, well, it'll shock you. So we're going to bring those out here in just a second. Now, who doesn't like a good mystery tool? Well, Royce has a good selection. We're not going to show them all to you, but we're going to just kind of talk about some of the ones that I really found interesting. Let's talk about this one. Now, we're kind of giving, well, we're kind of giving the hint away there. Yeah. <laughs> okay, you guys didn't see that. So take a look at this. It's a two-piece item. The confusing part is these pins up here. And when he told me what it does, it all of a sudden makes sense. And you called it a vulcanizer. So in the old days when you repaired a tire, you ha heat was your process. You didn't, it wasn't on a chemical melting process like it is now. So you would put the tire in there, or the inner tube. Turn it over. This, this is the exciting part. Fill this with gas and light it. And that'll heat up your uh, tube so and vulcanize it. Pins will transfer the heat evenly throughout. And the pins help transfer and the melt heat. the patch onto the inner tube. Right. I think that's so cool. You guys, we are so lucky we don't have to do that anymore. Then this tool here is fantastic. I love the handle on it. It's got a couple wheels. We even have a name on here. And I don't have my proper glasses on, guys. But tell us about this. Well, we'll give you a hint. It says sealed power on it. Okay. Corporation. And it does have like a little knurling, or some people thought this was a glass cutter. The days of the Model A, your pistons would get a little loose in there and start slapping and making noise. You could go in from the bottom side of the engine, take the pan off, take the connecting rod loose, slide the piston down until most of the skirt was exposed, and you'd run this up the side of the piston, and this would expand the skirt. So it would press against it would tighten that clearance up on the piston again. You work your way around. <laughs> and it's kind of like knurling a piston. It, you know, used uh -huh. to be common practice, but that's kind of gone away. Very cool. I'd never seen one before. So here is the ultimate mystery tools for you guys. Uh, ergonomically very comfortable. <laughs> I don't know. Is that just, that's just wood. And it looks like it has a tooth in here of some sort or a knife. Clamps down. So what do you guys think it is? I guarantee you probably have never used one. I used to have an uncle and had this type of livestock in his, in his, on his ranch. So Royce, take it over. Tell me about this a little more. Well, we can tell you're not from Colorado because a rancher wouldn't have pigs. <laughs> <laughs> from Wyoming. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's right. Farmers, Been a long pig time farmers, pig, pig farmers. Pig farmers, right. Yes, this is a pig snouter. And pigs have a snout on the end of their nose, and they'll root under anything and tear stuff up. You stick this over their snout, squeeze it down, and it cuts a notch in their snout. They can still root and get enough to eat, but they won't be able to do as much damage. And uh, today, I think you'd probably have a little trouble with the Humane Society. I, I, th I, th I think you might, but uh, we, won't, we won't allow them on my farm. How's that sound? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> All right, there you go, guys. I hope you've enjoyed this uh, little trip out here to Sterling, Colorado, visiting Royce and seeing his shop. Really a great place. There's some other buildings out back, which I'm not going to show them to you guys. I think we're just going to leave that as a teaser. I think that's a lot of fun. Royce, thank you so much for having me out here. Thanks I appreciate it. I enjoyed it. Excellent. Thank you. Thank well, guys, I hope you liked this video. I loved coming out to Royce and seeing his shop here in Sterling, Colorado. Now, a lot of you guys may not know, but I left Atlanta, Georgia around May 20th, and I'm coming up to Yellowstone National Park. And I thought it'd be really fun to see different shops. So what I did is I just kind of put out a call to say, hey, if you got a shop that's between here and Atlanta, send me an email. Send me an email to dale at metaltipsandtricks.com. And maybe we can put together a time to get together. Now, I don't know what my exact path is. It's kind of being led by you guys. So I'm going to be up in Yellowstone doing some photography. Send me an email, and when I go back to Atlanta, let's see what happens. All right, guys. We'll talk to you soon.